Ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies, I want to point out first that I'm very happy to be here. You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! And that's the bottom line, because when Zay Boney speaks, he speaks. What do you have to say about it? And how long has this been under the radar? Too long, if you ask me. Real Talk Junkies with Jeffrey L. Boney. Look, I'm not afraid to tackle the tough issues. Other people are scared to talk about this. Really? I mean, really? You had to take it there? And now, here's the host of Real Talk Junkies. What's good, RTJs? You know what time it is. Your boy Jeffrey L. Boney for another edition of Real Talk talk junkies live here on the forward times facebook page and instagram pages man your boy is excited about today's show because as always we're going to have some fire conversation and topics uh that are very uh important and of interest to you and we'll get into uh, a lot of those key discussions in just a moment i always want to encourage everybody to go check out the forward times uh page of course the uh forwardtimes.com is the website www.forward times.com to go check out the latest news uh coming from the black news perspective also check me out and engage with me personally jeffrey l boney.com again that's jeffrey l boney.com and of course make sure you stay tuned towards the end well of course we'll drop the uh, information for you to check out and get the upcoming new book that i'm dropping don't argue with me of course don't argue with me never can argue with me it's, well you can argue with me you just won't win but i'm just encouraging you not to argue with me because I'm always going to win that conversation. Anyway, we're going to jump right into this conversation today. Real fire show because of what's going on, not only uh, across the country, but here in the state of Texas. Now, it takes courage for anybody to stand up for a cause that they believe in, regardless of your race or uh, your your religion or your uh, political affiliation or whether people agree with you uh, or not as far as your position. We've all heard about many of those types of courageous individuals or may have seen those individuals in our lives. Even if you look at the history books, at least look at the history that they're not trying to ban or sweep under the rug these days, even here in Texas, you'll see that there are some individuals who display bold and unadulterated courage, whereby they've sacrificed their lives, their reputations, and even used their own resources to fight against unjust and inhumane laws that have negatively impacted people, particularly black people at the local and federal levels. You think about Rosa Parks, who chose to sit down in the front section of a bus to revolt against segregationist policies that were unacceptable when it came to public services like transportation. She was arrested. Think about the Freedom Riders who rode interstate buses and sat in restaurants across the segregated South as they protested the southern state's refusal to honor Supreme Court decision, making it unconstitutional to uh, discriminate against blacks relative to public transportation and amenities. They were spat on, they were disrespected, they were physically assaulted, some were even murdered and arrested. Most recently, we saw the courage of Bo- a former NFL quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, who chose to take a knee to protest police brutality and racism in America. Even when he said that that's why he was doing it and people didn't believe him or wanna believe him. He was blackballed from the NFL, lost contracts, and vilified by many people in this country. When you're facing backlash or repercussions for standing up for your convictions and doing what you believe in and what you believe is right, it often comes with a high level of praise or a high level of criticism. Oftentimes, it may cost you more than just a negative critique, though. It may lead to something even more sinister. In the case of the over 50 Texas Democrats who broke quorum and bolted from the Lone Star State on June 12th, they clearly counted the cost by making a courageous move to risk arrest so that they can stop a controversial piece of legislation regarding voting rights from moving forward. That's right, y'all. For the second time this year, Texas House Democrats broke quorum once during the regular regular legislative session and now during the special session called by Republican Governor Greg Abbott by leaving the state and traveling to Washington, D.C. to lobby the United States Congress to pass the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, 
which are Democratic authored bills that seek to strengthen the freedom to vote for Americans across this country. Prior to the Texas Democratic lawmakers breaking quorum, members of the Texas uh, Senate Democratic Caucus filed the Barbara Jordan Fair Elections Act, uh, Senate Bill 61, which would pr uh, protect Texas's freedom to vote, expand voter registration to meet the needs of Texas's growing and diverse populations through automatic and online voter registration, reform vote by mail uh, eligibility to allow more Texans to safely and conveniently cast their ballots, increase access to the polls for hardworking Texans and single parent families by incentivizing countywide voting locations and by promoting weekend voting, and then expanding access to the ballot box through the expansion of early voting, classifying election day as a state holiday and other common sense reforms. The lead bill author was state Senator Royce West, my frat brother. But as expected, it's received no significant support or traction from the Texas Republicans. This time, which is why I believe because they weren't getting any traction in the House and or the Senate, and they were pushing these other bills forward pretty uh, aggressively and at rapid speed, Texas House Grim Democrats uh, were joined by their fellow Democratic colleagues, or at least some of them in the Texas Senate in D.C., to fight against the legislation and to urge the United States Congress to act. Governor Greg Abbott, who called for a special session that began on July 8th, identified Senate Bill 7 at the time, a.k.a. the election integrity legislation, as one of his priority items and has wanted to steamroll the legislation forward regardless of Democratic opposition. There's Senate Bill 1 and 3 now. Of course, the potential passage of Senate Bill 1 and 3 towards the end of the legislative, uh, excuse me, Senate Bill 7 back in uh, May, uh, relative to the push that the Democrat, I mean, the Republicans had to kind of get that passed before the end of the legislative session was the primary catalyst for Texas House Democrats breaking quorum that at that time and sabotaging the legislation that was surely going to pass and get signed into law without their actions. The actions by the Texas Democrats in May led to Governor Abbott retaliating and vetoing a section of the state budget that funds the Texas legislature, its uh, legislature, its staffers and legislative agencies. Now, Governor Abbott has seemingly taken the gloves off even more, and he has threatened to have every single Democratic lawmaker who left for D.C. arrested. During an interview on Fox News on this past Monday, July 12th, Governor Abbott delivered a stern message to the quorum-breaking lawmakers stating the following, that he was going to have them arrested. The Texas House Republicans decided to move forward on Governor Abbott's call to action by voting on this past Tuesday, 76 votes for to four against to have the sergeant at arms send for at least 51 of the Democratic legislators who's, who left, demanding that they be ordered back to Texas unless they have an excused absence. Now, keep in mind that the Democratic lawmakers who ditched Texas but Washington, D.C., can only be arrested by the sergeant at arms or any other law enforcement official if they willingly return to the state of Texas. Otherwise, they cannot be legally touched until they return. How long that will be, that's anybody's guess. State Representative Ron Reynolds, who was a part of the quorum breaking group in May and is in currently in uh, Washington, D.C., right now lobbying co Congress for enhanced voter protection legislation, along with his fellow Democratic colleagues, joins me today on Real Talk Junkies to discuss their motivation for leaving and what they hope to accomplish. Joining me today right now is State Representative Ron Reynolds. What's going on, sir? Well, Jeffrey, Councilmember Boney, uh, Mr. Real Talk Junkie himself, uh, it is great to be back on your show, and uh, I love your show prep because what you laid out in your opening monologue was right on point. Uh, Governor Abbott certainly has set the tone, uh, and he has made it clear uh, that he will have us uh, at least attempt to have us arrested upon entry of Texas so that we can be corralled, uh, those are his words, backed to the Texas Capitol to make quorum so that we can uh, achieve his conquest of voter suppression. And we have, uh, me and some of my colleagues are defiant. Uh, we're not uh, going to back down. Uh, we're gonna stay and fight as long as we can uh, to protect the precious fundamental right to vote. And Jeff, one of the things I wanna add, the reason we chose to leave, to go to DC is because this is where it's at. We know, that we don't have the numbers to stop what they're trying to do uh, in Austin, Texas. We know that the Republicans control the governor, uh, the, the the lieutenant governor who presides over the Senate, as well as the speaker. 
as well as other every other state elected office in this state. Uh, but but you know that African Americans make up the largest population in the country right here in Texas. Texas has, I believe, the second largest highest uh, Hispanic population. And this bill, specifically House Bill Three and Senate Bill One, which by the way the Senate passed yesterday, will. Uh, have a disparate impact among black and brown communities. This is Jim Crow 2.0. I've been very vocal uh, about uh, how this bill would impact our communities, people who look like us. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this, Jeff, is that I know the fight that it took and the struggle, the sacrifice that our forefathers, whose shoulders we st stand on today, had to go through to get the precious right to vote. They overcame Jim Crow. They overcame so many obstacles. And here we are in 2021 because of the big lie from Trump arguing about voting rights again. So so let's let's talk about it, uh, Ron. You got some individuals who particularly uh, on the right uh, that are pushing for this legislation to become law here in Texas, uh, which is which is a part of a na nationwide, especially in the South, uh, initiative to try to uh, suppress the vote as far as the legislation is concerned, or at least scale back uh, voting access and various other uh, aspects of voting across the uh, United States, particularly like Arizona. Of course, we saw it in Georgia and various other uh, states. And now it's trickling into other states that are considered battleground states uh, across the United States as well, like Michigan and Ohio, uh, been having conversations and discussions about it. But my question is, what about those individuals that believe that you all are derelict in your duties uh, by leaving your uh, tax paying jobs. Uh, I know y'all don't get paid a whole lot, but, <laughs> but, but, but you are getting paid by the taxpayers to do a job and represent them. Uh, the governor is uh, in his duty uh, and has the right to call a special session as many unlimited special sessions as he, he wants to until, uh, you know, he's either uh, removed from office uh, or the next election. So, you know, upon you all's potential uh, uh, return, uh, if you all ever return, you know, he could call a special session for the next day and you would find yourself in the same situation. What do you say to those individuals that believe that you uh, you all are derelict in your duties and and, uh, you know, should be here to just, I guess, uh, face the music? Well, Jeff, that's a great question. And, and I want to I want to add, add one thing to that. And, I, and I'll answer the question. Uh, there's nothing special about this session. This is a suppression session. Uh, that's what me and some of my colleagues have deemed it as. There's, there, this is a suppression session because everything that Governor Abbott has added to this call is some form of suppression. Uh, yeah, there's, there's 11 agenda items, if I'm not mistaken. 11 mistake. agenda items, critical race theory, uh, uh, additional abortion restrictions, uh, border enhancement, uh, nothing about the grid, nothing about access to quality, affordable health care or uh, uh, paid sick leave. I could go on and on. But 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 let me ask you a question. So the question is, are we derelict in our duties? And I've heard Governor Abbott and my Republican colleagues, they, they they're saying that that's their talking points. And I will tell you this. You're absolutely right. The Republicans have the numbers. The Governor Abbott is doing what what, what is within his power to do as governor. But the Constitution of the state of Texas also provides that that there is no action that can be taken without a quorum. And so unlike other places where you have a filibuster, where you can talk a bill to death and we have uh, certain issues with that, our Constitution provides a remedy uh, that if there are two thirds of the members not present, then there is no business that can be taken. So. This is the fifth time in Texas history that members have broken a quorum. The fourth time was just uh, at the end of May when we broke quorum to kill SB7. So the Constitution allows this process. This is a extreme measure. But what the Governor Abbott is doing is extreme because, Jeff, you and I know that the bedrock of our democracy in America, not other countries, but in America is the precious fundamental right to vote. That is the bedrock of America. That is something that we hold near and dear. Uh, it is the liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Voting is a part of that. It is the fabric of what makes America different from other countries where they have 
uh, unitarian and totalitarian governments that are ruled by dictators that basically that that people don't have free and fair elections. And what they're trying to do with Governor Abbott is a solution in search of a problem. Our own secretary of state who was appointed and nominated by Governor Abbott, a Republican, went on record under oath before a House committee and testified that there was no voter fraud that in Texas, our elections, you can Google it, our elections for 2020 were sound and safe. That means that there is not something that we need to correct. And here's how we're correcting it. Not making voting more accessible, we're making voting more difficult, okay? So I wanted to say, the reason why we're doing taking this extreme measure is because they're taking the most extreme measure to potentially disenfranchise millions of Texans that particularly is going to impact African Americans. So yes, we are making good trouble. We are making good and necessary trouble by breaking corn, but it's a part of our duties. All right, we're trying to protect vulnerable communities. The majority minority of this state, black and brown folks, that's going to be disenfranchised. We are using this extreme tool that we have because we don't have many other tools. That's why we're here advocating to Congress that you got to pass HR1 and HR4, the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. When we met with senators today and yesterday, that is our rallying cry. When we met with Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday, when we will meet tomorrow with Senator Joe Manchin, one of two senators that's stopping us from exercising a provision to end the filibuster so that Democrats can pass it on a 50 vote threshold where Vice President is the tiebreaker. So this is a fierce urgency of now. We're here to buy some time for Congress to act because we want to save Texans from this drastic voter suppression bill that would have a detrimental impact among so many Texans' ability to vote. So yes, I'm proud of it. My colleagues are proud of it. If Governor Abbott wants to throw us in jail when we come back, so be it. But I believe that that's the least I could do because so many people, Jeff, as you know, died. They risked everything. They risked billy clubs. Some were lynched. Some were beaten. Some were hung for the fighting for the right to vote. Think about Fannie Lou Hamer, who was sick and tired of being sick and tired. People who made good trouble. I'm fighting to preserve everything that they were able to get for us. And in 2021, they're trying to roll back the clock thanks to Donald Trump's big lie. So so uh, one of the viewers, uh, Willie Pippen, said that the big lie is a scapegoat a pawn to mask the real true nature of the American spirit. Uh, but going back to some things that you said, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought those up, one being uh, the filibuster. Uh, I know that uh, you talked about you all having a constitutional right uh, to use this uh, tool uh, to your advantage as a means to fight uh, as the minority. Because of the, the quorum, the two thirds quorum. And you have individuals on the opposite end of the spectrum, on the other side of the aisle, who are pushing for this. Uh, and, and you think about what's going on in the Congress, who believe the same way of the filibuster, that the filibuster should remain intact uh, with the 60 uh, vote uh, you know, threshold, uh, and that it should not be, uh, pro, you know, there should be no provisions to allow uh, it to be reduced to 50 with the tie, the potential tie ring tie-breaking vote being the vice president. So what do you say to those that are, say, on the Republican side who believe they're using the same tool that they have in their toolbox to fight for the type of uh, uh, bills that they want to have passed or fight against the bills that they don't want passed? Well, Jeff, I'm glad you brought that point out because uh, the provision that I'm talking about, a two thirds, that is in our Texas Constitution. The filibuster is not in the United States Constitution. That is a Senate rule that they, the senators made uh, a few decades ago or a decade ago, but it is not a constitutional provision. And I would argue that just like uh, Majority Whip Jim Clyburn, who I believe Joe, uh, Joe President Biden wouldn't be president if Jim Clyburn hadn't put everything on the line for him in South Carolina that fundamentally changed his election. He went on record and calling the president out and saying he needs you to move to 
encourage the senators to use the nuclear option, a carve out exception for the for the filibuster for voting rights, because this is one of the most precious fundamental rights that we have as Americans. And he understands that our democracy is at stake because Mitch McConnell, the minority leader, has stated that they don't care. They don't want to negotiate. These are the same people because of the filibuster that are blocking a vote to investigate the insurrection that happened on January the 6th. But these are the same people, Jeff, bent on a hearing for Benghazi to shame former uh, 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 Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So I'm sick of the hypocrisy from the right. The Republicans, if it's a Democrat, Mitch McConnell, when he was the majority leader, his number one goal was to make Obama a one term president. He tried to stop everything that Obama tried to do. So when it came to his nominations, guess what? They blocked it. Those same senators made an exception to seat a, a, a U.S. Uh, 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 Supreme Court justice. So the Republicans can't have it both ways. And so now Senator uh, Manchin and Senator Sinema are saying we want bipartisan support or else we're not going to support it. And the Republicans are saying, well, damn that. So essentially what these two senators are doing is allowing the Republicans to, even though they're in the minority, to be the majority because the mm -hmm. House of Representatives has already passed H.R. 1. They've already passed it. President Biden is ready to sign it. So you got two senators literally holding up one of the most fundamental civil rights bills that we've passed since our own Texan, Lyndon Baines Johnson, signed the Voting Rights Act in August of 1965. So, yes, it is time for the U.S. Senate to act. And that's what we're here to do. We have met uh, uh, yesterday with Senator Cory Booker. We met today with Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator uh, uh, Blumenthal, who both said we want this bill to get passed. We met with uh, leader Chuck Schumer, who said we are encouraging. We're still working with our colleagues. If they want to tweak it a little bit, so be it. But we need to get this bill passed, because if we don't, Jeff, mark my words, that Republicans will be back in power and they will change the rules to fit their obje objective. They don't give a damn. It's, 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 it's go big or go home. These are the same people that will not call out Trump and his big lie, even though his former president, his former attorney, Rudy Giuliani, was recently his law license was suspended. His because of the perpetuating his, this this false scheme of voter fraud, the same attorney general that was doing Trump's bidding has went out on record, Attorney General, former Attorney General Barr, to say there was no voter fraud. Every Supreme Court justice that Trump appointed said there was no evidence. So what are we doing other than voter suppression? That's it, it, it is. I'm not going to I'm not going to make light of it because Republicans know there's no voter fraud. And yet it's still they're trying to disenfranchise my people, black and brown folks. So so you brought up Mitch McConnell. Uh, Max Cohen uh, sent out a tweet basically uh, you know, quoting what Mitch McConnell said about you all in your visit to Washington, D.C. He said, quote, this week, state legislators from Texas decided to grab some beer, hop on a private uh, plane and flee the state. In reality, they've just come here to Washington to snap selfies, unquote. What do you got to say to uh, the now minority leader, Mitch yeah. McConnell? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I think, you know, I'm going to use, you know, Trump's word on him, Moscow Mitch. But uh, I, I'm, I mean, I say that tongue in cheek, but 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 seriously, I, I think that uh, minority leader uh, Mitch McConnell has no credibility. Uh, he is hell bent on getting back uh, the gavel and being the majority leader, and he will win by any means necessary. So no longer does he want to win by great ideas, uh, by you know, good public policy and trying to broaden the base of the Republicans to appeal to minorities, he wants to win by voter suppression. And so for him to say that we're up here for photo ops, I'm sacrificing away from, from my, my, my children. You know, I'm sacrificing away from being home. I'm sacrificing from all of us, from husbands, wives, and, and, and other uh, uh, responsibilities. We're here to advocate for the passage of this federal legislation. There's no greater place than we can be right now to get this done than other 
than the nation's capital. We're holding key meetings every day that we're here. Again, tomorrow we should be meeting uh, with Senator Manchin. And then the next day is my understanding that we'll be meeting with Senator Sinema. So we're holding these key meetings and we are awaiting a meeting with President Biden. We met with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday. So these aren't photo ops. These are working meetings. Uh, we're all uh, eager to get back home. But for right now, we have business to take care of. And we are here to take care of our constitutional duty to advocate for our constituents. And Jeff, if you, you're, you're a great researcher, pull up the most recent uh, uh, public poll that was conducted by the Texas Tribune and the University of Texas that showed that an uh, overwhelming majority of Texans rejected uh, this notion that there was voter fraud that was on a bipartisan basis. But yet, it's, and just like the my colleagues pushed permitless carry, constitutional carry, whatever you want to call it, allowing people to own guns without background checks, enhanced background checks, or no permit at all. Uh, uh, that they, they, they did that where over 70 percent of the people said that it was bad public policy. So they don't care about what's best for the majority. They're only catering to the far extreme of the Republican Party that is on the far right, that believes in these conspiracy theories. So that is the people that Mitch McConnell is beholden to. So we're no Mitch. We're not here for photo ops. We would much rather be back in our districts or even at the Capitol if we were doing something that was constructive for Texans, like fixing our damn grid that's broken so that we can have reliable uh, 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 coolness in the heat in the summer and then heat in the winter. That Why, why, why aren't we focusing on that? Why are we focusing on uh, 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 access to Medicaid expansion so Texas won't continue to lead the nation and the number of uninsured? We're one of 12 states that don't have Medicaid expansion. So there are issues, Jeff, that we should be focused on instead of voter suppression and taking away a woman's right to choose. Can you talk to us about the key parts of the bill uh, that have been laid out that you all, you all are vehemently against? I, I think it's important for the, the listeners and the viewers to know exactly what's in the bill that you, uh, particularly as um, a representative of the Democratic Party that is left and that is against, uh, but also you all as a whole that you I mean, clearly you all are on the same page here. What are the key aspects of the bill that you all have a, a, com a complete opposition to? Well, well, Jeff, th th this this you'll appreciate this uh, being uh, in the in the greater Houston area. Uh, this bill really is an assault on the success uh, that was made from Harris County in terms of a record turnout and, and, and even Fort Bend County taking away local control. Uh, from municipalities who are closest to the people. You know that as a council member, you're closest to the people at the local level. The county judges and the mayors and the council, those are the that's, that's closest to the government. When you set up operations for your constituents, voting centers, uh, this bill would take away the authority of local uh, uh, county judges, mayors, commissioners to set up 24 hour voting locations within their jurisdiction one two it was it would take away your ability to set up mobile or drive through voting locations no longer would you be able to do that that would be illegal no longer would you be able to have polling places open uh past the hour of nine o'clock p.m no longer would that be available you would not have that authority no longer would you be able to to, to stop partisan poll watchers. So the Proud Boys, it, they, they could come to a community near you. So if you vote over at the Power Center uh, and you got some, some remember, we got open carry. So some guy wants to come in with his with his gun and, and he's looking at you strange and who wants to see, he wants to get right on top of you, then this bill would authorize that. As extreme as that sounds, that's what this bill does. It allows poll watchers to not have a distance marker between how close they can come. So they can literally look over your shoulder as you go into the voting booth. That is ridiculous. This bill also uh, allows for uh, a, a, uh, a judge to, it makes it easier for them to invalidate a, uh, a legitimate election. Another, another key provision uh, that we're really concerned about is a situation that we saw with uh, Crystal Mason and that we saw 
uh, with Hervis Rogers, uh, I believe his name is, uh, who is the attorney general just uh, uh, brought charges on. This bill would make it easier to bring criminal penalties and prosecute people for felonies, for minor mistakes on voting applications or some other minor voting infraction. It would basically make it criminally uh, enhanced just like it would be more severe than like an aggravated robbery. And so this is very uh, concerning to us is because they're basically trying to uh, uh, scare people from minor vi violations of, of, of simple mistakes. Another thing, it, it makes it more difficult for mail-in ballots, right? So right now, as long as you have a, a reasonable impediment uh, in terms of a disability, you don't have to state what that disability is. It could be whatever. Right. You don't have to state it. But this new law would would, would uh, allow you to disclose what your disability is. You may not want to say that you have MS or you have HIV or AIDS or whatever it is that you have. That's a disability that prohibits you from doing something. You would have to disclose that on that application. That is a violation of of the uh, of HIPAA laws. And there's nothing else that will require you to do that. Right. But this new bill would, would require you to do that, to get a ballot by mail application. It would also limit where you can return ballot by mail application. So Harris County, for example, is a humongous county, larger than some states. You would only have one place where you could turn in a mail ballot application. So there's so many gotchas in here. Jeff, let me just make it clear. None of these things make voting more safe. There's nothing in here that would prevent voter fraud. So what are they doing? They're trying to make it more chilling to vote, not doing online voter registration, which which were, Texas is one of 14 states that doesn't allow online voter registration, not allowing for same day registration. So if you recently moved to a community and you want to vote, guess what? Sorry, you missed the deadline, sir. Most states have it where you can register to vote on the same day of an election and then vote. So. All I'm simply saying, Jeff, is there's so many provisions that are unnecessary that are just like during the Jim Crow era. It After the passage of the 15th Amendment, African-Americans could vote. But then they had Jim Crow laws, poll taxes and literacy tests. It didn't say blacks couldn't vote. But if you had to guess how many bubbles in the bar of soap, if you had to pay a poll tax and they know most black folks were poll, then they couldn't vote. Well, guess what? This law is making it more difficult because the first thing they did, Jeff, after Obama won in 2008, my first term in office, they came up with the most restrictive voter ID laws in the country. That's what the first thing they did. This is the next barrier that they're doing to further. No, the second barrier was eliminating straight ticket voting. That was the second thing they did because they believed that in long ballots like Harris County, most people wouldn't go all the way down the ballot where judges are if they couldn't vote straight ticket. That was the second thing. This is the third layer right here to make it more difficult. So those, it, it's been a process. And how do I know this? I've been on the elections committee uh, for two terms and that's all we dealt with. And we saw the playbook that was devised by the Heritage Foundation and other conservative outlets that would curtail the access to voting. So this is chilling and this is Jim Crow re in 2021, what we call Jim Crow 2.0. So, so Ron, you know, uh, I, I go back to the fact that the governor, Governor Abbott, has issued uh, arrest warrants uh, for you all. Uh, the House just voted 76 uh, to four uh, to have the sergeant at arms do what needed to be done to have you guys brought in, uh, you know, as far as uh, to do your 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 duty. Um, I remember I want to say it was 2003. Uh, where the same thing took place with the breaking of the quorum and uh, several uh, individuals left the state. And subsequently, uh, uh, this was about redistricting. And uh, one of the Democratic representatives that had left the state, I want to say this time they went to Oklahoma. Uh, I think the initial time they had gone to New Mexico. Uh, but when when they when they had the power to continue with the quorum, one of the uh, senators, which is still a senator uh, at that at that time, ended up coming back, and that was Senator John Whitmire. 
uh, and subsequently the uh, Republicans were able to get the redistricting law passed. Do you foresee uh, that this potentially could happen again, seeing that you all have break, broken quorum, but you know individuals kind of breaking rank and, and coming back home and facing the consequences? Jeff, you, you're so well uh, researched with your due diligence. You're absolutely right. The last time was 2003, and those were the killer bees, is what they call them, the killer Ds. Uh, and we had Senator Whitmire, uh, he came back and allowed for the quorum uh, to move forward because he peeled off. That likelihood is still there. Some Democrats get weary. They get threats from the leadership that they'll strip them of committee chairs. We've already heard it's already started happening. Well, if you don't do this, re redistricting is coming up and you're going to be drawn out of your seat. You know, they're making all kind of veiled threats now. Some members stayed behind. We had four Democrats that stayed in Austin that didn't break quorum. The rest of us did. So so to 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 your point, that is a concern and a consideration. Right now, we're all united. We're, we're united and we are determined to stay the course all the way through August 7th, which is the last day of the first call uh, special session, suppression session. Uh, Governor Abbott has indicated, as you stated, he will call special after special after special all the way through, in his own words, election day. So that means that he is determined to do this. So we don't know. I don't know. I'll be naive if I thought maybe everybody would hold out forever. That That's not realistic. But I do hope that my colleagues will hold out until Congress takes action to pass H.R. 1 and H.R. 4, because if they don't, this bill will go into law and it will be effective upon the next election. And mark my words, there will be many people that will be impaired and disenfranchised because of these new restrictions. And let's just not forget that the last time we killed the bill in May, Jeff, they were killing souls to the polls, brother. They were killing the, the bedrock of the African-American community is souls to the polls. They had it in the bill that you would not be able to have elections on the Sunday before election until after 1 p.m. That was by design, brother. Because of mm. our, our filibuster, our breaking quorum, that is that aspect is dead. They've already said, hey, we won't bring that back because they caught so much hell and they couldn't justify why they were doing it. The other piece that they tried to do was to lower the standard to invalidate an election. They 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 took they took that off the table as well. So we've made some progress already. I hope that if we continue to have our resolve, that we'll make more progress. But ultimately, the goal is for Congress to pass the voting rights protections that we're that we're up here advocating for right now. So so you're in D.C. right now, uh, State Representative Ron Reynolds, uh, District uh, House District 27 uh, on Fort Bend County. And uh, joining me today also uh, fresh out of a meeting that they had to attend early, but wanted to make sure that they came on is someone who is on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, as it relates to uh, these uh, these laws and this special session. And of course, uh, has a, a take, I'm sure, on uh, you all breaking quorum and, and leaving uh, the state. And that, that's uh, none other than uh, House District 19 State Representative uh, James White. Welcome to Real Talk Junkies, James. Hey, thank you for having me on Real Talk. How you doing there, classmate? Hey. All right, doing well. Oh, hey. you're talking about Ron. Yeah, hey, just thank you so much for coming on. So, so hey, listen, let's just jump right, right. into it. Uh, thank you for being uh, on Real Talk. I know okay. you're very, very busy, uh, and I take it for, take, thank you for taking time to be on. So you're, uh, you're uh, let's just be, put it out on the record, you're a Republican uh, state representative. And uh, you yes, are sir. still in Austin, yes, Texas at the moment. Uh, tell everybody what uh, what area of the yes. state you come from, first and foremost. Hey, thank you so much for that. Hey, uh, Jeff, I'm extremely proud to be on the House floor this afternoon. Uh, we represent a East Texas district, uh, Polk, Tyler, Jasper, Newton, and Hardin County. All right. And so you're still in Austin at the moment. And... Uh, you are in support of, of these particular bills that are being brought forth and uh, are prepared to uh, vote for them uh, in favor. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, uh, 
Now, which bills are you talking about? You know, when you're oh, not talking, we me, primarily we're, talk about I'm one sorry. bill. We're so talking about house bills, bill. the, the House bill and the Senate bill relative to the uh, quote unquote election integrity. OK, House Bill 2. Yes, sir. OK. We're supportive of that. Yes, we are. All right. So let's talk about let's talk about it. What what is it that uh, uh, is it about these particular bills that is something that has encouraged you to be supportive of them? What is it about these bills that you feel is necessary uh, so that you believe that this is going to benefit the state of Texas and the Texans as a whole? OK, well, HB2, I believe, is one piece of legislation. It's not several bills, but, it, you know, maybe. The, the ideas come from several bills, but it's one one bill, House Bill 2. This particular House bill uh, allows our seniors and disabled Texans who choose to vote by mail. It gives them six days to cure their ballot. Uh, if there's a problem with their ballot, uh, they can be informed by phone or email to come down and, and correct their ballot so it can be counted. Uh, this bill, compared to current statute, adds hours to early voting. It codifies, I think all of our county clerks do this, and election judges do this, but it codifies it in statute that if you are in line before the official closing of the polls, um, you can remain in line. To cash your vote, no one can tell you, you know, if, you know, you, you got to get out of line and come back tomorrow. Uh, those are some of the um, provisions. It does have a provision to require you when you go down to a uh, to your clerk's office and you want a mail ballot. It does require you to show some form of identification, but that's something consistent we have for voting uh, at least since 2011 when I came into the legislature with Ron. Uh, that, that's something that's been consistent since 2011, that you have to have photo ID. So we shouldn't throw out the photo ID requirement uh, when it comes to uh, mail by uh, voting by mail. So those are, are, are some of the features uh, that are in the bill that add hours compared to current statute and make sure that people can cure their ballots even up to six days after the election. So what is the what is the genesis of the, the need for this particular piece of legislation? Uh, you know, many people are saying that it's because of uh, former President uh, Donald Trump's, uh, as they call it, big lie uh, as, as, as it relates to uh, what they believe or he believed were some uh, voter issues. Of course, it's been researched that there are no voter issues significantly in Texas that would warrant these types of, of changes. But you got individuals such as the, the Democrats who left who are saying that this is a Jim Crow 2.0 and a form of voter suppression. What are your thoughts on that? Well, this is this is fascinating. Um, codifying in rule, I mean, excuse me, codifying in statute that if you arrive on time before the closing of the, of the, of the, of the election polls, that you can't be turned away. Um, that that's not something that needs to be addressed or have codified. I mean, I have heard from from voters across the state where they have been in line before the official closing of the polls and been turned away. I've read about that in, in newspaper articles. So I'm fascinated to know that is um, something that doesn't need to be done. The idea that, you know, if, if, if on your mail ballot is you know, you, you, you're missing maybe a, a number in your um, zip code or, or maybe someone can't make out if it's a E or a C and they want to have you come down and try to cure that before they throw your ballot in, 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 in the, you know, do not count box. Uh, all of these things that to say that these things don't need to be tightened, that, that's interesting. That's news to me. But let me tell you this, but, Jeff, but, it's, but since I've been in the legislation... Are... But State Rep Representative White, aren't the things that you just talked about already in place? There are some additional things that I uh, that many of the Democrats are saying that are being uh, that have been added to this bill that have absolutely nothing to do with, with the things that you okay. just after mentioned, well, such as okay. the. Uh, well, that's, that's great. But, but let me let me tell you, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's great. But let me tell you, when you read a bill, you know a change is made to the bill when something is underlined and something is strike through, right? 
Okay. So those things that I've talked to you about, those are just those few things. There are other things, right? But those few things I've talked to you about, they are underlined, which means they're not in statute now. Okay. But to your point, uh, since I've been in the legislature, roughly 200 to 220 bills are filed every session and they go to the House Elections Committee. Uh, they go into every, uh, about 200, 222 bills are filed every session dealing with some of these topics that we're talking about. And that's every session. Uh, every session, I've seen bills on ballot harvesting, on registration, on, you know, how voters are to present themselves um, at, at polling places. In fact, my first session, I filed legislation and passed it that uh, required um, election judges, if they thought they needed armed security at their polling place, that armed security had to be, has to be, excuse me, um, licensed Texas peace officer. The next, my next session in 2013, I filed and passed legislation that started a pilot program for our uh, veterans in the combat zone that they can submit their ballots through a secure Department of Defense system. So bills on elections are filed every session, about 200 of them. Right, but, but Representative, you know, we're, elections, Representative, White, yeah, we're, talking, uh, Representative White, we're talking about a bill that would potentially become law that uh, has come out of committee uh, mm -hmm. and that would be slated. It's already been passed mm -hmm. now by the Senate uh, in the House, I mean, uh, the Texas Senate. And of course, mm -hmm. it would have probably been passed in the Texas House if mm -hmm. not for the Democrats uh, bolting and leaving uh, to go to D.C. So my question is, I just want to talk about a few specific things. What is wrong in your estimation? Because okay. if you, you say you're supportive, hold on one second. You say you're supportive of the bill. What is wrong with souls to the polls as you know it to be? What is wrong with uh, drive through oh, I don't, voting? I don't, what is wrong I don't think anything is wrong. Say, say what again, sir? Okay. I don't think there's anything wrong with souls to the I don't think there's anything wrong with souls to the polls. So, I don't so, think anything's wrong with it. But, but, this, but, the, but these are part, parts of the bill that are being introduced that you said that you would vote for. Okay. I think the, um, right now, in the, and, and I, I sit on that committee, the House Select Committee on Constitutional Rights and Remedies that heard 23 hours of testimony. I believe that bill uh, the draft that we looked at and passed out over the weekend, I think it starts that Sunday voting at 9 a.m. Okay, so my question is, there are, be, there are parts of the bills that that have been brought forth by your your uh, indiv the individuals on the opposite side of the aisle mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. that have, have talked about various things, such as the souls to the poll. And, and Ron, if you want to chime in yeah. and, and highlight some of those yeah, things. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say this. I, I, Jeff, I have the utmost respect for, for James White. We're classmates. He's a great chairman. Uh, he, he sits on that on that committee that, that heard uh, those 23 hours of testimony. And, and, and Jeff, here, here, here's what I want to point out. There were 484 people that registered uh, for public comment. There were 407, 407, Jeff, that marked themselves opposed, opposed to this legislation that Chairman White supports, and only 65 in support, 12 neutral. So you had 407 people said this is bad for Texas. You had only 65 that says this is good, good, and 12 were neutral. So, so Jeff, most Texans don't support this bill, and 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 and, and we didn't we didn't talk about the the, the fact that they want to ban drive through voting. We didn't talk about that they want to ban the ability uh, for for local control for counties to have extended voting hours. Uh, uh, other than what they deem necessary. We didn't talk about the enhanced penalties uh, for, for criminal prosecution, for minor uh, mistakes. Uh, there, there, there are so many other provisions that, that we find very offensive uh, that are in this bill uh, that would have a chilling effect. The fact that you have to, uh, uh, is more difficult uh, for, for mail-in ballots. Uh, there, there are so many different things that, that, that again, the whole voter ID deal, there's so many gotchas in, in, this, in this new bill that there's no problem for. I mean, again, where is the election fraud? I served on the elections committee uh, for, for, for four years. 
and, 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 and I dealt with these issues. Our secretary of state is over the elections. Our secretary of state, as Chairman White knows, has said that we didn't have a, a, a problem with our elections in Texas. So why are we why are we dealing with this? Right. I have a question for you, uh, Representative White, uh, going back to uh, we'll get back to the bills mm -hmm. uh, the bill itself uh, in question. Yeah. Uh, there was a vote that was just recently taken. Uh, uh, the vote was uh, 76 to 76 for and four people against to uh, authorize the sergeant at arms uh, to go forth with uh, arresting uh, and issuing a, a arrest warrants and to go forth to, to arrest the uh, Democratic colleagues. Uh, were you in support or were you against that particular uh, bill? I, w I, I was. I was for affirming the rules of the House. Those are the rules of the House. And, and frankly, those are the provisions of the Texas Constitution. OK, so do you believe that through their conviction and what they're using as a tool in their toolbox, you believe that is a, a criminal act? Well, it's not a criminal act. It's not listed as a criminal act. It's listed as provisions in the Texas Constitution and the rules of that. So as it relates to uh, issuing an arrest warrant, you only can arre uh, issue an arrest warrant to someone who's committed a crime. Is that correct? Okay. I mean, I've never heard of the, the rules, the, 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 the Texas Constitution. Um, it's a provision in the Texas Constitution. When a quorum isn't reached, it gives the House the uh, discretion to bring and or compel members to come back to the chamber and that, that's in the house rules all that is in the house rules i'm not for intimidating bribing or coercing anyone to do anything that's outside of what you know in our in our house rules or in in the in the, in the texas constitution so so here, here's the point if, you know if you know people do what they want <laughs> obviously right but you know, folks bring up things about drive through voting, drive through voting and 24 hour voting. Those those provisions are not in code now in the election code. So I don't know how I can ban something that's not in code now. The Texas Constitution, Section four of the Texas Constitution only gives. Excuse me, uh, uh, Section six of the Texas Constitution only gives the Texas legislature the legislative authority to make rules and regulations of court uh, uh, concerning voting. So we can have the discussion about 24-hour uh, voting. We can have the, concern, the, 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 the um, uh, discussion about dri drive-through voting. We do have drive-up voting. But we can have these discussions. But these discussions start in the legislature and uh, or at least end up in the legislature. They don't terminate with decisions made in, in various individual counties. And, and look, this is so, so, I mean, yeah, just because I can explain make, the situation doesn't necessarily let me I agree with it. Okay. So, as it Representative White, as it relates to your your voting uh, and how you view things, because I know everyone votes their convictions and they vote uh, based off of who uh, you know elected them to to represent them. But in this particular instance, as mm -hmm. Representative Reynolds mm -hmm. just pointed out, at the most recent marathon uh, weekend over the weekend. Uh, hearings that took place, uh, 400 plus people stated that they were against and opposed to this particular bill. 60 some odd people said that they were for it and like 12 people were neutral. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to the, Amer to, to the Texans uh, that mm -hmm. come forth and let their voices be heard, do, we, mm -hmm. do you listen to them or do you make your own determination based off of whatever you know is the party line or whatever the agenda is for uh, the people that you represent? It's a combination. But ultimately, I'm sent, I'm sent here by the people of East Texas to read every bill. Okay? Look, I chair the House Committee on Homeland and Public. We lost the sound. We, I think we lost your sound, Representative White. We lost your sound, Representative White. We, we lost your sound, sir. Okay. Do I have you back now? There you go. All right. We got you back now. Okay. 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 
where, where did I drop off at? Um, you you said that you you were talking about uh, you chairing uh, a particular committee. I didn't okay. hear which one. You said. Right, right, Jeff, right. Jeff, I apologize. I, think, I have to get on at two o'clock, and I, I'm I'm. A- but to, to, there's something I have to do legislatively here uh, in DC. So I'm gonna have to get off. I, I appreciate the discussion and uh, I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the future. But I, unfortunately I have to. No, no problem, uh, State Representative Reynolds. We appreciate you for being on. All right, go, go right ahead, Representative White. Yeah, I chair the, uh, the House Committee on Homeland Security and Public Safety. There were situations where uh, I looked at the, the count of witnesses that came and testified. There was more that were against certain portions uh, of, of the George Floyd Act or police reform than that, that were for it. But again, I have to read the bills. And this bill, um, I'm sorry, it, it's, there's just no voter suppression. And I think I've sent you a, a, a copy of it with a markup. Okay, there's just no voter suppression. I'm just, matter of fact, many of the provisions that I've talked about during our time on this call here, uh, Jeff, many of those were ideas that were brought by my fellow Democratic colleagues. But you know, but you know, Representative White, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, and I understand your mm-hmm. your position. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of civil mm-hmm. rights uh, groups. There are a lot of uh, activists. There are a lot of mm-hmm. uh, individuals on the mm-hmm. opposite side of the aisle who completely disagree with you and they they believe that's that the american the way of that's the american of way. Course, uh, mm-hmm. are, are, are deemed voter suppression but to your point you know there are a lot of individuals who were vehemently against including members of law enforcement vehemently against the what you all have deemed constitutional carry uh which is permitless carry uh that you all recently voted on and was signed into law in the regular session by uh governor abbott uh, they yeah. were against that mm-hmm. uh, vehemently, and you all passed that uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, and so, so I, I'm just of the belief yeah. that. And let me tell you. Let me tell you why. Was, let me tell you why. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and let me tell you why, Jeff. Because that's why we have the Constitution. There's some things. There's some rights and freedoms that are so precious that you just can't chunk them up. To popular opinion. So I, I understand it on, on constitutional carry, but the second amendment. So, so, so people walking around, code, people walking around at the age of 21 or older uh, without a permit is constitutionally what needed to happen in your in your estimation? No, no, that that no, was I'm, I'm something saying, that the I'm constitution, what, constitution warrants? Jeff, I'm saying the constitution says and the Second Amendment and the Twenty Third um, Bill of Rights, right? In the in the Texas Bill of Rights, it provides Texans the right, if they're legal citizens and they have they have uh, acquired it weapon in a legal way, it the Constitution protects them. If you so, if so, you read the so plain, I, yes, sir. no, go ahead, go ahead. If yeah. you read the if, plain, if you, you read the see. plain language, the plain language of the bill. I mean, excuse me, of the Constitution, it does that. So, if, if that's the case, uh, one of the the viewers said, in that case, uh, anyone that has gun charges that are black uh, that would have qualified to have been right, uh, able to carry uh, a, a gun, uh, a weapon, uh, without a permit, that were arrested for that, should they be released? What, what do you mean anyone that had retroactively, gun charges? Retroactively, I think that's what I heard you say. Retroactively. Someone okay. that may have gone to I, jail. I, and, and, and it was, and, and, and in fact, they were lawful to carry? Is that the question? And they were lawful to carry, right?
interact. Yeah. Let me get back. Let me get. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, listen. I'm um, sorry. I, I lost you. Yeah, we. Lo I lost you for a second there. I don't know what happened, but nonetheless, listen, Representative White. Uh, we're we're up against the clock here, and I just okay. give you a few uh, seconds to share some final words, and uh, we're gonna get up out of here. Yeah. To uh, to your point, I do believe that lawful Texans who have been erroneously arrested and may have their gun rights um, denied or they want to get that arrest record cured, I do believe that they should have that happen, okay? And I have supported legislation. I think there is a uh, this, uh, uh, Chairwoman Sinfronia Thompson, she actually had an amendment on the bill that does open the door for folks to go in and cure their records and be able to continue being lawful, um, you know, gun carrying Texans. If I could do one more thing, um, I, I did sit on that committee that heard the 23 hours of that testimony, Jeff. I was the only Republican that crossed the party lines and voted for a Democratic amendment that would, by, by, uh, by uh, Chairwoman uh, Nayabe that would have, if this bill passes, I'm talking about the election bill, okay, where we would have the Texas Secretary of State monitor the provisions of the bill and and be able to report back to the legislature and even to the Department of Justice on any type of um, disparate, significant impact on certain demographic groups. To the point about the penalties or the enhanced penalties that are in the election bill. I believe it was Chairwoman Sinfronia Thompson that brought an amendment to the committee to, the committee to deal with that. Um, and I told her I was sensitive to that issue. This is something that we need to look at. And some other members on the committee said that as well. And what she agreed to do is to pull her amendment. She pulled her amendment that morning and said that she wanted to, you know, continue to have having those discussions before we got the bill to the floor. So, I mean, I, I have crossed the line. I mean, crossed the partisan line to vote for good Democratic amendments that make uh, election bills stronger or any bill stronger. Well, hey, listen, Representative White, I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on Real Talk Junkies. I will have you back in the near okay. future uh, to talk about uh, some of this, uh, these other things. Uh, going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of conversation centered around this. So I hope to have you back. Thank you so much. God bless All right. You. All right that'll do it, guys. We're about to get up out of here. Real Talk Junkies every Wednesday, live 12 noon Central Standard Time from 12 to 1. Always want to make sure that you tune in. Let everybody know www.forwardtimes.com. Make sure you go check out JeffreyLBoney.com. And of course, don't argue with me. Holla at you next week, y'all.